coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. We can be passionate about other stuff. Let's put a, a, a table out and roll some cards out and play some spades or some dominoes. I bet everybody that sits around like a bump on a log will get real loud. Ten. So if we can be passionate about that, we ought to be able to be passionate about the one who was and is and is to come. The one who in our very being, we live and move and breathe. The one who created the world. The one who knows every number of hair on our head. We ought to be passionate about that. Let us pray. Father God, we praise and honor your name. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, you are excellent. You are great. You are greatly to be praised. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk a little bit about passion fruit. Passion fruit. Not the fruit that comes from the Brazilian plant, uh, the Brazilian passion flower, but fruit that evokes emotion. Uh, fruit that people should be passionate about. I have strong opinions about fruit. Really strong opinions. I don't eat watermelon. <laughs> don't touch it. Don't care for it. Don't like the taste of it. I feel like it's bland. Has no taste. Funny story. My uh, mother, when she was pregnant with me, ate an entire watermelon every day and steak every day. Garbage man would be mad at her every time he went to pick. And when I say a uh, watermelon every day, I'm not talking about the little small. I'm talking about them big long ones. <laughs> Cut it sideways, flip it over with a can of Morton salt and just ha ha have, a, have a ball. And so I love steak, but I hate watermelon. <laughs> because after that and then growing up, as soon as watermelon was in season, that meant that I was going to have to see a brand new watermelon every day. <laughs> and I got tired of looking at them. So I stopped eating watermelon. <laughs> now the funny thing about watermelon is, I know how to pick a great watermelon. Because oh, wow. I had to go out and get them all the time. So I know what it needs to sound like when you knock on it. I know what it needs to feel like when you squeeze it. I know what the stem needs to look like. <sighs> yeah, I hear my mama clapping. <laughs> I know what a good watermelon is because if I brought home a bad watermelon, uh -huh. there was a problem. <laughs> so growing up, I decided to stop eating watermelon. I didn't like the taste. It was, it just, it brings back too many memories so I don't eat it. <laughs> There's some other fruit I don't like. Okay. I don't like, I'm a texture eater, so I don't like mango. I don't like mushy, stringy food. So like uh, uh, papaya, yeah, like uh, av av avocado, yeah. that's all nasty to me because I'm a texture eater. And I take it to the point that not only do I not like it, I don't like, not, that, not only do I not like the fruit, I don't like fruit flavored, that fruit flavored candy or juice. Can't stand it. Uh, let me put the picture up now, please. Because uh, I don't like fruit flavored juices of fruits that I don't like. Uh, when I go to Mr. Donuts right around the corner from here, which is also where we get our donuts for the church, I always get um, two 
um, jalapeno sausage and cheese jumbo kolaches. <laughs> and I get a V8 fruit flavored juice. Now they have three kinds of juice. They have the tropical fruit, they have the berry blend, and they have the mango peach. What you are looking at is the shelf. All of the peaches, uh, all, all that's left is mango peach. I think I'm the only one that comes in and drinks those juices. Everybody else gets the milk or the orange juice or the coffee. Uh, there is the V8 Splash mango peach because I'm not touching them. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have passionate opinions about fruit. But just like there are fruits that I don't like, there are fruits that I like. I love a nice red apple. I feel like strawberries and cherries are the greatest, especially on cheesecake or in a shake. The fruit, it brings out emotions in me. I'm passionate about fruit. But even then, the fruit that I'm talking about today is not the fruit you eat. All right. Amen. It's the fruit that is produced mm. or action, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things that, that come out of it. I'm talking about something that causes something to happen. Mm. It's been all these times when growing up with these debates about what's a fruit and what's a vegetable, whether or not a tomato was a fruit or a vegetable, it's a fruit. Whether or not avocado was a fruit or a vegetable, it's a fruit. Cucumbers, all these things. And I learned later on what the actual difference was between a fruit and a vegetable. A fruit has a seed in it. So when a fruit is produced, that fruit is designed to make more. It's designed to make something else. It's designed to grow on. And, and we use that terminology all the time. Uh, when you go to uh, the store, it's in the produce aisle. That's something getting done. Uh, we're in the Bay Area of Texas. A lot of us either did or know somebody that worked in a, in a refinery where they made things out of what came out the ground. And what do we call that? A plant. Mm -hmm. Fruit producing things. Matter of fact, even to get ordained, one of the questions that they asked was, did I have fruit in ministry? Was I just up here trying to look for a steady job and a pension, or was I doing something? Right. Was there fruit in my ministry? Amen. Passion fruit. Yes. Not what you eat, but what is produced. Amen. Paul, the apostle Paul, had fruit in his ministry. That's why we have Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. These were places he was going Telling people about Jesus, starting a church there, then coming back or writing a letter, sending them back to tell them what they ought to be doing as a church. Amen. Paul had fruit in his ministry. And he had so much fruit in his ministry that he caught some haters. He caught some people that did not want to, to acknowledge what he was doing in ministry, didn't care much about what he was doing and thought he was doing it wrong. And some of the ones in Galatia, this is how we got the letter to Galatians. They were people, missionaries that would call them, that were trying to convince these people who Paul had just gotten to follow Jesus Christ that they weren't following Jesus Christ right. All right. These were believers. Yes. Can you imagine that? Church folk telling other church folk you not doing church right? I know y'all never come across anybody like that, so I'm going to just put it in the example. They were saying that he didn't follow the correct rules and that they had certain laws that needed to be followed in order to call yourself a true follower of the way. And they were saying, you know, yeah, you got in, but you're not really in until you go in my way. 
Yeah, you, you are part of this, but this is not what's going on. And so Paul had to write a letter back to them to let them know this is what happened. And that's why he starts off in the first uh, verse of chapter 5 telling the people at the church at Galatia to stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free. Jesus Christ is the one that saved you. Yeah. Can't nobody else put you in a heaven or hell. Jesus Christ is the one that saved you. It didn't matter how many letters somebody else got behind their name. It don't matter if they daddy poured the concrete of the church or if they granddaddy uh, hit the first nail. And Jesus Christ made you free. It didn't matter about what you, I got some Bible for that. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All the old things have passed away. They are free in Christ. They have protection from the legalism of the legalizers. In freedom, Christ has set us free. That's a wonderful sentence. In a few short words, it's a gospel claim, but it's also a missional clause. You got free. It's time for you to help some other people get free. You don't just take your freedom and keep it to yourself and go on about it. You're supposed to take that freedom that you had and go get other people and make sure that they get free. Amen. This is not a yoke for them to have. And sometimes when they use a yoke, it provides stability and guidance. It, it tells the animal which way to go and keeps them from going to the left or the right. But sometimes the yoke can be uh, something you chafe against something that prevents you from going forward. And he's here to tell them that they are free. And now that freedom doesn't mean you can just go do whatever you want. It's not freedom for self-indulgence. Right. It's freedom in Christ. Yeah. It's freedom from yeah. being oppressed by the law. It's freedom from being oppressed by people who ain't got all they stuff together, but instead of spending time working on themselves, they talk about you. Because if they talk about you, nobody's going to look at them. Yeah. It's freedom from that. Hallelujah. It's freedom from thinking that you got the keys to heaven yourself and can't nobody else get in. Okay. It's freedom from dealing from people like that. And he says that this, this, this work of Christ has freed them from the bondage of the law. And this work of Christ will someday free them from the bondage of the body. Uh, so they got the protection from the legalism of the legalizers, and there's also protection from the license of the libertines. He warns against using this freedom to just do whatever you want. Yeah. This freedom is not unrestrained permission to do whatever you please. Paul reminds the church at Galatia, the Galatian Christians, that God called them to freedom, but asked the, and tells them in verse 13 not to use the freedom as a liberty or, or, or the liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. And when Paul uses the word flesh, it's sarks in the Greek, uh, and it's often a shorthand for self-centered living as opposed to God-centered living. When he's talking about flesh, he's not talking real deep about uh, the, uh, the inherent evilness of man or any kind of other uh, uh, fancy doctrine. It's straight up, are you self-centered or are you God-centered? Yes. Uh, the counterpoint to living life in flesh, he says, for you brethren have been called to liberty, not only to use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Uh, no matter how many times I, I try to find a verse, it comes back to what the Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls, my New Testament professor, said over and over again. You cannot be a Christian outside of community. Over and over again, the word for church didn't refer to a building. It referred to people. James told us that true religion was to take care of the widows and the orphans. Psalm told us, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. If we're going to do this thing called Christianity, we are not supposed to do it by ourselves. Amen. It is literally faith working through love. And love is the way uh, uh, that freedom and Christ express itself. Christ makes, a radic makes radical loving service possible and it fulfills the will of God through human relationships. 
uh, for freedom uh, is not just the, the opposite of slavery, but a matter of whom you serve. And, and many would uh, follow, would define freedom as serving your own desires. But Paul is saying not to do that. Don't be self-centered. Yeah. Don't indulge yourself. And he says that it will drive us into a vicious cycle where people devour one another. They are consumed by one another. Time and time again, I run across people who have not been exposed to the church and they have no problem once they get exposed to the church. They have no problem with the one called Jesus. They have no problem with the God. They, they have no problem with the Holy Spirit. Their problem is with the people sitting in the pews. They love Jesus, but they don't want nothing to do with Christians. Uh, compulsively engaging in such behaviors that can never uh, be freedom, but 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 going out and, and itself only talks about the, the works of the flesh being uh, uh, selfish ambition and, and and adultery and fornication and uncleanliness and lewdness and idolatry and dealing with these things. Church is a funny place. Church is a funny place. The only place I know that they say was an army. The only army where we shoot our own wounded. The only, our, the only place I know where if somebody messes up, we immediately want to sit them down and, and, and make a public embarrassment out of them. And we make a big public embarrassment out of them because we hope don't nobody start looking through what we've been doing. Only place in that selfish ambition one has been getting with me because I, I just be it's, it's just interesting to me because I think about the people is we, 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 we got a potluck going and not like anybody in here would operate like this. But when I think about selfish ambition and bringing things up, that's like somebody deciding that they need accolades for bringing the plates. I brought the plates. Y'all should be happy I bought the plates. You should be ashamed of not bringing the plates. Did you see how I brought these plates? My name needs to be put in the bulletin because I brought the plates. <laughs> Selfish ambition. And these things, it's this freedom that he's talking about, this freedom, we're supposed to love one another. Truly free acts occur when one considers not only themselves, but others, more specifically, the other. We should spend some time thinking about, you know, yes, we are in church, but who do we know that is not in church? Who do we know that has not reached the same status as we? Who do we know that has, may not have done the things that we have done and gone the places that we have got, gone and gotten the good jobs? Who, and when I say the other, that is a general term for those who are not like you. Amen. They may not look like you. They may not be from the same place you're from. They may not even speak the same language as you. Amen. But reading the Bible over and over again and talking about is, is always talking about the other. We are not in this for ourselves. Just ourselves. Amen. And it tells us, one commentator says that uh, Paul is reminding us that Christ's perfect freedom engages us in a call. The call uh, it carries an obligation to our neighbor as well as our God to invest ourselves in the community of faith. To put up with dealing with fellow congregants and their wearisome ways against we put the sandpaper to their rough ways okay. and their rough edges. The call compels us to, uh, to prepare our hearts for worship so that we must be fed or no sharp hunger to exist in a community with such openness and generosity that our neighbor's well-being is just as important as our own. Amen. This fruit that we're supposed to do this fruit when fruit produces itself fruit is not a, the fruit produces and it's about producing others real fruit is not supposed to stop at itself and so there's conflict and there's contenders and working with the flesh and then we got to live our life according to the holy spirit 
And when we live our life to the Holy Spirit, the type of fruit that is produced is great. <sighs> now, this fruit doesn't happen naturally. You don't just walk out tomorrow and decide that it's all going to go. It, it takes some time. All right. Just like you can't lose weight overnight. Mm -hmm. Just like you can't uh, learn anything overnight. Just like you can't repair broken relationships overnight. It all takes time and it takes work. And the flesh, that self-centeredness, that, that disconnectedness, that, that being of desire to fill our own things, we have to beat that down and produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our freedom in Christ is not only evidenced by our results, but it's also evidenced by our character. Uh, one commenter said that commentator said that it is shown uh, by the fruit we bear. Mm -hmm. Do people think of you and think of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control? Do they think about that? And the interesting thing about all of these fruits is they're social. Ah, uh, <laughs> there are some people that that um would take this sermon and they would take those nine fruits of the spirit and, and divide them up into three different sections of, th of three and say that God, is, and God dealing with God is love, joy, and peace and dealing with others is patience and goodness and kindness and dealing with ourselves is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But I would submit to you that they're not broken up that way. Uh, you need love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to deal with God. Uh, you need uh, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control to deal with other people. And you need uh, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to deal with ourselves. Yes. So it's not uh, three, three, three. It's nine for all of them. Yes. It's nine for all of them. And the fruit is the result of the harvest of the spirit. And the word that they use for faithfulness in the Greek is the word that's used for faith elsewhere. We got to have faith, and we got to have faith in the spirit. This is a life of passion. And if you got to call these nine qualities fruit, then they are passion fruit. There should be something that comes out of what these things. And why shouldn't the Christian be passionate? Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 100 verse 2, to worship the Lord with gladness and to enter his presence with singing. The Bible says other way to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We talk about being passionate with every other thing, but then we get all quiet and want to sit on our hind parts when it comes to talk about God. And, you know, there was one time I would think, well, you know what, it probably doesn't take all that. We probably don't need to be intentional about our passion for worship. But I, I've learned when I've seen these things, nobody says it don't take all that when, uh, uh, when uh, Deshaun Watson scores a touchdown. All right. Nobody rubs their, 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 their chin together when they see old James Harden dribble the ball for 35 seconds, then drive to the lane for a layup. Nobody says, hmm, that's great. We can be passionate about other stuff. Yeah. Let's put a, a, a table out and roll some cards out and play some spades or some dominoes. I bet everybody that sits around like a bump on a log will get real loud. Yes, Ten. So if we can be passionate about that, we ought to be able to be passionate about the one who was and is and is to come. The one who in our very being we live and move and breathe. The one who created the world. The one who knows every number of hair on our head. We ought to be passionate about that. The fruit that is produced should be something that causes us to act. And to the extent that we express these virtues, not only should they be of us, but they should be of us because they were of Christ. He, he it was an example of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And so as we head 
to this weekend. It's a holiday weekend, Independence, and we're going to meet with friends over the holiday and neighbors. Let us renew our interest in expressing those things towards other people, the love and the joy and the peace and the passion. Just as passionate as we can be about them, we ought to be about God yeah. and sharing God with them. And if you don't know anybody else that doesn't know God, you probably need some more people to hang around. Yeah. Jesus told us to go out and make disciples right. and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So if everybody you, and I'm not saying you don't need Christian friends, but if everybody you hang around is already saved, I might argue that you're doing it wrong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come. Thank you for listening to this message. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you found this message. If this message blessed you, be a blessing to someone else and share it. Connect with Pastor Johnny on Instagram and Twitter, and be sure to like Faith UMC Dickinson on Facebook.